Right, so for anybody who doesn't know, this is Justin, and uh, we're talking about mon in-ear monitors. Afternoon, everyone. Um, the first thing, I'd, well, actually, I'd like to say two things before we start. Firstly, uh, today I'm going to be talking about the monitor engineer's view of in-ear monitoring. I'm not going to be talking about the RF side of it, the radio side of things. Today I'm going to be talking about what it's actually like as a monitor engineer dealing with artists who wear in-ears uh, and the various uh, connotations of that as far as your show is concerned. So um, in-ear monitoring, uh, it's an, an interesting field. It's, some, it's a tool that we've been having to use more and more. Um, it evolved really as a result of uh, the, the music industry's uh, very rapid evolution of PA systems in the late 70s and early 80s, and the fact that uh, rock and roll shows have become bigger and bigger. Now, one of the big problems with regular acoustic monitoring uh, is that on a loud, particularly on a loud rock and roll stage, um, it's uh, quite difficult to get any kind of definition of what you need as a result of environmental interference. And the bigger the gig, the larger the problem. When you get to the stage of playing arenas uh, with a conventional left and right proscenium arch style PA system, um, we have the issue of chasing the sound wave down the room and dealing with the reflections when it gets back. Now, if you sit on the stage in Wembley Arena and you hit the snare drum, uh, you will have uh, at, uh, what was it, I calculated it the other day actually, I can't remember, I think nine, 90 BPM, you, you're uh, just under half a bar later, the reflection from the back wall comes back at you. This means it can be extremely difficult just to keep time. Uh, and because of the nature of the acoustic change between sound check and show, uh, it's an extraordinarily difficult thing to calibrate. So musicians, the larger the format the show, the more difficult it is to play uh, using uh, acoustic uh, technology, that is uh, free air acoustic technology, wedges uh, and side fills, uh, if you are using uh, a large conventional PA system. So the obvious answer uh, is to eliminate the reflections problems by firstly uh, putting a transducer near your ear so as you hear things uh, in real time as they're played uh, at the speed of uh, electricity rather than the speed of sound. Uh, and the second thing is, of course, that the, the in-ear offers a barrier. Uh, it's actually an ear plug, an exclusion device, as well as uh, an aid to monitoring. So this is the history of it. It started off with drummers wearing headphones in the late 70s, early 80s, because it was the only way that they could keep in time. And uh, it has now evolved into uh, a, a fairly complex, interactive and um, complicated science uh, that involves all sorts of specialist kit. Yeah, that's kind of how it evolved. And um, I'm going to talk first of all about the technology. There are really three bits of the technology, transmitters, receivers and the moulds. Uh, the, the earpieces themselves, uh, initially uh, the, uh, the in-ear thing was an extension of studio monitoring, which is uh, you know, headset based almost entirely, it's almost impossible to use uh, free air acoustic monitors in recording studios because of the spill. So the headphone, the use of headphones in performance evolved from the studio uh, environment uh, and uh, bit by bit encroached its way into the live environment. And uh, many recording studios offer the artist the ability to, to an extent, mix their own monitors. The typical way of doing it is that you get a four or five sends from uh, the studio console, which have groups, you know, there'll be a drum group or uh, there'll be a vocal group, there'll be, uh, depending on what kind of music it is, uh, something to pitch, something to time. Uh, and uh, these groups are controlled by the mix engineer 
Uh, and so you, you are presented with a little console into which you plug your headphones where you can mix varying levels of these groups depending on what instrument you're playing, what you need to hear. Because obviously each musician's monitoring requirements are different. And this, uh, this technology has kind of pervaded, has kind of hung around in the, uh, in the live side of things to the extent that um, several console manufacturers actually manufacture, uh, and I, I would think the DigiDesign PQ thing is uh, the best example, the one that probably most of you have seen, uh, is that actually there is a system that is designed to work on exactly this principle. Uh, where you, you send musicians a whole bunch of mixed groups and they have their own little controllers. Uh, there are a number of artists, particularly people who uh, play with large bands and uh, use string sections, percussionists, brass sections, you know, the aspects of the orchestra rather than the rock band. Um, <laughs> very often you'll find people using these kind of mixed group methods of mixing monitors. Um, I've worked with a number of artists who use them, and um, it means that actually the artist has got a lot more control over what they're doing, and that they don't have to continually interact with the monitor engineer in order to affect changes in their mixture in the performance. But mostly, by far the more common way of, uh, of mixing in ears is with a monitor engineer, sometimes two monitor engineers actually, uh, and a regular console. Now, um, the, uh, <coughs> the technology uh, for in-ears presents us with a whole set of different problems. First of all, the moulds. Uh, the, the, it's a three-part process. The first deal is that you go to an audiologist who puts a bit of string in your ear and then squirts it full of uh, a, uh, some sort of um, uh, material that will set, usually a silicon plastic. Uh, that gives you a mould of your ear canal. They then take that mould uh, and they pull it out of your ears using the previously mentioned bit of string and um, they, uh, they will then send it away to the manufacturer um, who will make impressions from the mould. They will make a mould from the impressions. Sorry, it's the other way around. So you have a negative. Uh, they then put all of the electronics in a package inside that mould and uh, then squirt it full of the resinous material that they're going to use to make the actual earpiece out of. That's how the earpieces uh, are, are constructed. And there are essentially two different types, although these days there are some manufacturers who will offer you uh, a mixture of uh, different kinds of uh, materials. Um, the, uh, the difference is essentially hard and soft moulds. Uh, companies like uh, Ultimate Ears, for example, who uh, are uh, a, a company who've evolved from the music industries uh, rather than from the hearing aid technology. Um, they uh, they off mostly uh, offer you hard moulds, that is, moulds that are not malleable enough to uh, change shape as your face changes shape. The, there's a company called Sensophonics, uh, who come from the other side, from the hearing aid technology, uh, which is all driven by a whole different series of criteria. And uh, they make really nice little soft, squidgy silicon rubber moulds, some of which are temperature sensitive and become more malleable, more pliable, the warmer they get. I much prefer the second type. Uh, and um, if you've had any of you had any experience of wearing ears, particularly the hard shell ears over any length of time, uh, is actually, in a curious way, a very tiring process. And um, I'm not suggesting that you do this now, but feel free if you like, because uh, there's no law against it. But if you stick your finger in your ear and you move your jaw about, as I'm doing now, you can feel the movement of the jawbone changes the shape of the ear canal. Uh, so if you're playing and singing, uh, then this constant small changes in the shape of the ear canal, particularly the exit of the ear canal, uh, will cause the moulds to move. So there's all sorts of goo that people recommend that they, uh, bar barrier creams, 
Uh, there are little bits of sticky tape that are specially made that you stick around the mould every time you put it in your ear because the whole deal about in-ears is that what you want to achieve is a hermetical seal between you and the outside world uh, to minimise the audio interference that comes from your environment, uh, therefore giving you much greater control. Now, um, this can be a difficult thing to do, of course, so that's the moulds, uh, as I say, essentially two types, hard and soft. The advantages of the hard ones is that you can put sockets on them uh, so as you can replace the cable, which you can't with the soft ones. Uh, if you have a cable fault with a soft mould, you have to throw them away and buy another set. And at four or five hundred pounds a time, uh, this can be uh, uh, fairly expensive. Um, so... Um, that's the deal. When you go to have your fitting, uh, I mean, you can actually have impressions made in spec savers uh, for 30 quid or something. It's, uh, uh, it's not a particularly complicated process. But my advice to you, if you are going for yourself or uh, a band or an artist, is to go to a proper audiologist. I would recommend the company I use is Handheld Audio. Uh, because they will actually give you a hearing test as well. Um, you'd be surprised at the results of people's hearing tests. I constantly am. Uh, one of the interesting things about it is that very often, um, it's something that's extremely difficult to measure. And we come across this at all levels of use of in-ears. It's actually really hard to know what's going on in somebody else's head. And to be honest, so as far as dealing with musicians is concerned, it's knowledge that I don't really want to have. Um, nevertheless, you have to deal with it acoustically. Uh, now, people's perceptions are different. Uh, very often, the hearing response left for right uh, is substantially different. And actually, it needs to be, uh, because part of the human physiology uh, is uh, that we do most of our balance and orientation with our ears, not with our eyes. As anybody who will know who's ever had a severe ear infection can make you fall over uh, because it really does actually affect your balance, your ability to walk. Uh, but most of our spatial orientation, our mental spatial orientation, is done uh, by the ear intuitively measuring uh, the difference in arrival times. It's actually a remarkable piece of kit, the human hearing. But you'll find, if you look at it uh, in any kind of empirical way, that the difference between your left and right hearing responses is quite substantial. And uh, it's particularly pronounced in what I call the telecom frequency. That is to say, the uh, three or four K of bandwidth that is around one kilohertz, uh, which is what the uh, old school uh, rotary dial style telephones used to work on. Narrow bandwidth, therefore, requiring uh, a lot less transmission power and uh, much cruder technology meant that telephone technology became easily accessible for a lot of people. And this is where all of the human voice works, this, this kind of bandwidth, all of the, uh, <coughs> the intelligible detail, the intelligibility of speech is all around this bandwidth. And this is why there are substantial differences between left and right. Uh, is so as you don't get the same information from both ears. So it makes it much easier for the brain to orientate where the voice is coming from in the space, how to differentiate the voice from reflections, all of these kind of things uh, have an effect on your hearing. So when you stick something in your ears, you're excluding your environment and you're taking away your brain's ability to orientate yourself uh, in your audio world in this way. Uh, so straight away, you are essentially disabling people to an extent uh, of one of their senses, uh, or at least the working part of one of their senses. Um, so I think it's really important to get a hearing test done. And if you are a monitor engineer who's working exclusively within ears, it's also uh, extremely important for you to take a regulatory view of it, uh, because um, some of the Moulds that we use these days have got three, four, five drivers in them. And some of the DJ in ears have actually got two travel drivers, a mid-range driver, uh, and three bass drivers in them. They're really quite efficient 
serious bits of kit and it's possible to do yourself a considerable amount of damage, not just yourself, but your artist. And because you can't measure it with an SPL meter, you can't measure exposure uh, or level, um, it's something that is really easy for you slowly, particularly over the course of a tour. Uh, it's something that can run away with itself. And before you know it, you find yourself inflicting permanent hearing damage, not only on yourself, but on your artist. So again, it's really important that you bear this in mind whilst you're doing it, because as a monitor engineer, mostly you are going to be asked to turn stuff up. Rarely do people take the sensible approach and go, excuse me, Mr. Monitor Bloke, can you turn everything down except my voice? It's much easier for them to say, turn my voice up a bit. Do that three or four times during the course of the show and you realise that during the course of the show you've put 5 dB on the, on the vocal. So you are reaching, reaching a stage where uh, <clears throat> every day all of the levels of your mix increase. And if you don't do something about it, if you don't back it all off after the show every day, uh, then within two or three days, uh, you're going to run out of headroom and you're going to start deafening people. So it's really important to be on top of that regulatory side of it because, as I say, there is no empirical way of measuring it as there is a uh, sound pressure level coming off a pair of wedges. Um, there are also some other things that uh, I consider to be really important as far as servicing an artist is concerned uh, within ears. Um, you need to be really on top of managing the whole moulds, cables, belt packs, hygiene uh, is really important. And as a monitor engineer particularly, you'll find you're in and out, in and out, in and out with the, uh, with the damn things all day. Uh, and if you drop your mould on the floor, uh, <clears throat> It's got a tiny little bit of a grit in it. Next time you stick it in your ear canal, you're going to stretch the inside of your ear canal. Uh, and because of the repeated in and out, it's likely that you're going to get an infection, which makes it impossible to wear them uh, for the subsequent fortnight or three weeks. I had this happen to me. I've had an inflamed ear canal from a little scratch from a bit of crap that was on one of my moulds when I stuffed it in my ear at a festival. And... Um, it's very painful and unpleasant, as well as actually preventing yourself doing your job properly. So um, really pay attention. If I am working for an artist uh, as a monitor engineer, uh, the first thing that I will, I mean, yeah, it's difficult to insist, but I, it's really, really important, is that everybody has the same moulds, the same type and manufacturer. Because if you're dealing with a bunch of artists who've all bought their own, and some of them have bought you know, the, the cheapest they possibly can. Other people might have spent a bit of money and got something that's seriously nice. Um, you, uh, you will never be able to deliver consistent results because the frequency response uh, and the, the, the general sound of all of the different types of moulds, even within one manufacturer, even within, for example, the Ultimate Ears, who manufacture specifically for uh, the music industry, they all sound different. So you need to be able to calibrate your, your, art, your stage right from the start by knowing that what you're hearing is what they're hearing. And this means everybody's got to have the same. And even then, with the differences between people's hearing and the acoustic environments they're in on stage, obviously, it's going to sound very different sat on the drum stool than it is uh, for the keyboard player or the singer uh, because of your environment. And in-ears don't exclude the environment, but they help you to be able to get over it. So, first of all, make sure that everybody has the same moulds. Secondly, make sure that you really look after them properly. My deal as a monitor guy is I keep everybody's moulds. Uh, and every day I get them out. Uh, before sound check, uh, and I'll alcohol swab and clean each one individually. Um, I usually carry a, a hot air gun or a hair dryer, 
uh, because that is the best way of getting rid of the earwax that builds, I'll tell you, it's a glamorous job. Um, uh, the best way of getting the earwax that builds up in the, uh, in the little tubes that lead from the drivers to the uh, excursion into the ear canal out of the end of the mould. Um, <coughs> earwax is a defence mechanism that your ear produces and the louder the environment your musicians are in, uh, the more earwax is going to be generated, the more you're going to find it bunging up the ends of your moulds. It's extremely difficult to get earwax out. It is an unpleasant and glutinous substance. Um, and the best way of dealing with it is to warm the moulds up with a hairdryer because earwax becomes quite runny uh, at higher temperatures and you can literally pour it out. And then you can get down the end of the ear mould with a little tool. I also... Uh, Use those little interdental brushes that you can buy from your chemists, you know, if they're, they're sort of little toothpicky kind of a things, particularly the little wire ones that you can bend the end of. They're great for getting down the little holes in the moulds and, uh, and getting the goo out. And uh, another good piece of advice for you, actually, and I say this to bands that I work with, um, because earwax is a defence mechanism and it builds up, you need to deal with it uh, on a regular basis. Uh, otherwise, if you have a serious build-up of earwax that starts to impair your hearing, if you go and have your ears syringed by a doctor, uh, then it increases your sensitivity sufficiently so as it's going to be really unpleasant uh, going back. You can, you, know, you can have attenuations of 10, 12 dBs uh, as a result of earwax. And so um, when you put your moulds back in after having your ears syringed, it's a screaming, unpleasant, painful experience. And you have to be very careful about that because that's the stage at which you can really hurt yourself. Um, so first thing in the morning, when you get out of bed, your earwax is at its runniest because the temperature in your ear canals is at its highest because you've been lying down all night, you've not been moving very much, so the air doesn't, in the ear canals, doesn't get moved around. If your head's been on the pillow, then you've got a, a specific confined air space. So the ear wax temperature is higher. So if you're gonna do the Q-tips down the ear canal, that's the time to do it, first thing in the morning. The worst time to do it is after a show. Uh, and if you have problems with uh, ear wax buildup, a little drop of olive oil in your ear canal before you go to bed at night, uh, out of a little dropper bottle, Really works wonders, softens the earwax up, lovely it does. Um, right, um, as I say, hygiene's really important, being careful, uh, have a good look, you know, uh, to get a torch down the end of the moulds, make sure that they're all nice and clean. Um, I do two battery replacements every day. Uh, I carry everybody's belt packs and uh, I make myself up a little butler's tray that I take to the dressing room with little boxes with everybody's name on, the moulds and the cables all neatly labelled and coiled, uh, so it's really nice and easy, and I go back to the dressing room after the show every day and get them all back. That way, it's down to me, I can keep my eye on the cables, figure out if cables need replacing, I'm on top of all of the spares, I make sure that everybody gets the same belt pack every day, uh, because there are some people who like their mixers in stereo, some people like them in mono, some people use the EQ facilities that are available on the belt pack. Um, if you're using uh, uh, acoustic aids to in ears, and I'll be talking a fair bit about that in a minute, um, then there are different processes that you need your belt pack to go through. Some people have wired belt packs as opposed to radio belt packs, and this leads me on to the next thing, which is the frequency response of the systems. Um, there are three things that you need to think about. First of all, the frequency response of the transmission device. Secondly, the constraints placed upon uh, frequency reproduction by changing it into radio waves and then back again. Uh, and then at the other end, you've got a little belt pack, um, the size of this kind of thing, uh, which has got a battery in it. Uh, now, this obviously is the amplifier that drives your in-ears. It's by nature, by definition, a small, low-powered amplifier, or a small amplifier with low power requirement, shall we say. That doesn't mean to say that the drivers are not efficient and can't produce quite a lot of sound pressure level. In that way, they are very powerful tools. But the amplifiers that we use are relatively low power, 
and can very often be frequency discriminating. So uh, it's important, again, to use the same kit for everybody uh, so as you at least know uh, about the results that you're getting, that all the belt packs sound the same. Batteries. Uh, as I say, I change batteries every day, twice, once for sound check, once for show, uh, because uh, I need to be able to put my hand on my heart every day if we do have a battery failure, and as far as regular chemical batteries are concerned, Duracells, uh, you will have two in every hundred fail within uh, minutes of, uh, of plugging them in, and you never know. So you need to be able to put your hand on your heart and go, yes, sir, I changed every battery before the show. Uh, it's uh, extremely wasteful, and you finish up with boxes and boxes of batteries that you give away to all your mates' kids for their PlayStations and various other handheld devices. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's really important that you do it. And um, myself and a colleague learned a most unfortunate lesson a while ago uh, uh, when we were doing it. He was babysitting me on an Ineers tour. I think we had seven artists to deal with. And um, so uh, the production came to us and said, look, we, we're really not down with you using all of these batteries because they'd seen the requirements, you know, how many batteries we need per show. And it's actually quite a lot. Yeah, if you're talking about seven musicians and seven techs, you know, you're talking about 18, 20 belt packs uh, with spares. So that's, uh, that's 80 batteries a day. Uh, if you change twice for, uh, for sound check and for show, it's quite a lot of batteries. So if you're doing 100 shows, that's a flight case full. Uh, and so the production centre said, we're really not down with this. Uh, so, um, guys, will you go out and buy a bunch of, uh, of rechargeable batteries? We went, yeah, that's a great idea. Good thinking. So we went out and we bought 200 rechargeable batteries and a couple of industrial chargers. Now, I don't know if any of you know anything about battery technology, but um, uh, NICAD, uh, that's nickel cadmium or nickel metal hydride batteries, have a specific life. Uh, most NICADs are generally uh, good for about 100 charges, something of that nature. After that, the imprinting of the battery, that is its memory, its ability to take the full charge, start dropping off rapidly. Now, with regular chemical batteries, when they fail, they fail slowly. With rechargeables, they just stop. And so imagine our predicament when after we, some of these batteries may have had 80 or 100 charges and several of them started failing out of our stock of 200. And we realised that we didn't know how many times we'd charged them. Because unless you barcode every individual battery and keep a record of how many times you've charged it, even that, you know, the, uh, the retailer's shelf rotation of putting the new ones at the back and the old ones to the front is only approximate. So suddenly, after you've done 80 shows, your entire battery stock is unreliable. And it's unreliable in a way that your artist is not used to, that the pack just goes off. It doesn't slowly fade and die. It doesn't give you notice and warning that the artist can do something about it. It's just that moment of blind panic in the middle of the show. Oh, I can't hear myself anymore. Um, so, um, big problem. Uh, and you really do, if you're going to use the, go down the rechargeable battery route, you need to have a regime. Uh, otherwise, it's a false economy uh, and it's going to come back and bite you in the bum big time. So, um, I'm afraid it's back to the old chemical Duracells. Mostly uh, sad, but uh, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, uh, unless I'm in a position where we can do the investment in the kit in the first place, and uh, you know, it's pretty much a full-time job staying on top of the frequency management and the belt pack management, um, let alone actually doing any monitor engineering. The other thing is, of course, that different people's, as far as the battery concern, uh, power consumption is concerned, different people's. What I like to 
uh, monitor at different levels uh, and particularly if they're using supplementary devices like wedges or shaking risers or butt kickers, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute as I say, uh, their power requirements from the belt pack itself are different every show. So some musicians will consume only half of the battery power that others do. Uh, again, difficult to predict uh, and much more difficult to measure. Now, talking about supplementary stuff, uh, there are some people who insist on using in-ears and wedges at the same time. Now, my advice generally is if you're using in-ears and wedges for the same program, then you are in a world of trouble. Because particularly if that's vocal and pitch information, um, you have got uh, all sorts of audio issues, phasing being one of them, particularly uh, the phase relationship between the drivers in the wedges that you're using and the drivers in the ears that you're using are in constant change because you're constantly in motion. And because the low frequency reproduction isn't being done in free air, even a very small move can lead to extreme comb filtering style interference. You also, of course, have arrival time issues. And especially if you're doing festival or arena stages, big stages where your side fills are a significant distance in terms of the time envelope away from your centre wedges, then you need to be delaying the wedges back to the side fills, which means that the arrival time difference between the audio from the side fill, the pressure wave from the side fills arriving at your ear, and the, the, the energy that the driver is producing arriving at the eardrum are quite different. Uh, and in the case of big festival stages, different, en different enough for it to have a masking effect on the programme that you're trying to actually listen to. So it can be, it can create many more problems than it solves in terms of the extra reinforcement. Now, there are many musicians who I've worked with who uh, aren't entirely convinced, as I am not, by the whole new set of technology that we have to use, digital mixing desks and uh, uh, radio transmission. So what if somebody kicks the plug out, you know, the old argument? What if the rack stops working? What if one of the aerials stops working? You've lost your entire monitor system. So there are many of us who like to deploy wedges as well as a backup. Uh, but my deal is I won't switch them on unless I need to. Unless somebody takes their ears out and throws them on the floor, then I open up the wedge mix. But it does mean that at least every now and again, you have to sound check the wedge mix, even if you're using all your own production kit. And certainly if you're doing local production stuff, you need to sound check wedges and in-ears every day, uh, which makes the sound check a lot longer and more tedious. Uh, but if you want to have a bulletproof show, got to do it. Uh, because you can't just take an in-ear mix and stick it in the wedges. Uh, they are uh, two very different systems that don't, you know, certainly as far as the mix is concerned, are not interchangeable with each other. So that's the, that's the full range loudspeakers dealt with. However, there are some bits of loudspeaker style technology that massively help uh, as far as uh, frequency response is concerned for your artist. Um, has anybody had any experience of a butt kicker? Anybody, anybody, no, okay, well, um, uh, the, the shaking technology, as I call it, uh, the history of that is uh, in Hollywood, actually, uh, in the review theatres, in all of the studio cinemas in Hollywood, uh, there was a technology race, particularly in the 50s and 60s, uh, for better and better audio technology, better and better sound systems, and then with the introduction of the Dolby style encoding and then surround systems and all of this, uh, cinema audio was the driving force between our entire audio industry really up until the late 80s, early 90s. And one of the things that a Californian company called Aura, who were originally a loudspeaker manufacturer, 
one of the things they came up with was a little 35-watt uh, transducer, uh, which looks like uh, a horn driver. Well, in fact, essentially, it's what it is. It's a little inch and a quarter voice coil <coughs> device with no loudspeaker. Uh, it makes a membrane vibrate. And the idea is that you take two or three of these devices and you screw them to the, uh, the wooden floor underneath each row of eight cinema seats uh, and the seats vibrate. And you give them a low frequency program, generally speaking, 70, 60 hertz and below. So it's very narrow bandwidth. You're not asking the driver to do a lot of work. Um, and, uh, and it makes the whole thing vibrate. Uh, and these vibrations are transmitted through your body. It's nothing to do with the ear canal. It makes your body cavities oscillate and you feel the bass. You've all felt the kick drum and the bass guitar in your chest at a rock gig. That's exactly what we're trying to do with these little aura shakers. Um, one of my first proper serious in-ear gigs was the pop act that we had no backline on stage at all. And so I used these aura shakers to, uh, to build shaking risers. I had four shaking riser decks uh, uh, for the four musicians that were stood on them, a guitarist, bass player, keyboard player, drummer, a uh, percussionist. Um, and um, it worked fabulously well. Uh, I'd got a, uh, I built myself a little system using a BSS sound web, uh, which is a, a basically a configurable processor. And so I built myself some little crossover and EQ systems uh, and a uh, four-way power amplifier. Uh, so each one of the shaking risers had different program in it according to the musician's need or taste. Um, and I also had a butt kicker for the drummer. Now the butt kicker works on a similar basis, uh, although it's different technology. Essentially, the butt kicker is a washing machine motor uh, that's driven by an amplifier. Uh, and again, it has low bandwidth frequency response and the vibration comes from an eccentric cam and two heavy uh, rubber stanchions that are bolted to the chassis of the device. Uh, the whole motor assembly is suspended inside the device, so the whole thing shakes uh, and it shakes at, at a predictable frequency. Uh, and you bolt this to the post of the drum stool uh, and uh, you uh, offer your drummer a service of only fitting bass, essentially. Um, uh, <clears throat> and uh, it works fabulously well. Uh, I personally think that uh, we could take this technology one step further uh, with uh, wireless suppositories, but that's not going any further down that road. Um, it's an interesting thought, though, isn't it? You know, especially for the rave. Um, <laughs> So, um, uh, yeah, right, next thing, um, transmitters. Uh, transmission is a difficult, another difficult issue. Uh, like I say, RF technology is extremely complicated and difficult. Uh, and so we're forever having transmission issues. Uh, but really, um, if you're going to be using uh, a serious in-ear system, then it's vitally important for you to get yourself active aerials, aerial combiners, uh, and make sure that you've got bulletproof BNC cables, uh, BNC connectors like the jack plug and the MIDI connector, particularly the five pin DIN plug, are the work of Satan. Uh, do not belong in our industry. They were never designed uh, as professional audio connectors. Uh, they were designed as cheap solutions uh, to connectivity problems and you know why to this day we're still plugging quarter inch jacks into electric guitars I really don't know uh, when the XLR provides us with a proper serious balanced noise free bulletproof connector uh, but hey that's just how it is really I guess um, so uh, yeah BNC connectors are horrible uh, they really are as anybody who's ever had to use them to, uh, you know, in an industrial way, uh, will concur, I'm sure. Um, so it's vitally important that you get yourself serious bulletproof versions thereof and bring a lot of spare cable with you. Um, because being the, the cables, uh, again, uh, RF cable, which is essentially coaxial cable, uh, unless it's properly shielded and armoured, 
Uh, it's much more fragile, much more prone to repetitive strain injury through coiling, through being having the, the, the 90 degree bend at the back of the rack where you plug it into a horizontal panel and it drops vertically. So there's a moment on the cable all the time and it's the same moment all the time. But spend the money, do it as well as you possibly can. Make sure you have backup aerials, make sure you've got one really long cable and one really short cable so as you can get a big distance between your transmitters uh, so as you don't have hot and cold spots on the stage all of that. Um, now, uh, frequency management, again, as I said uh, at the beginning, I'm not really going to talk about this except for the fact that you need to know a bit about it uh, because one of the things that we have to do these days is we have to purchase licenses for transmission. Now, uh, the whole change in the way that the legislation has worked European-wide over the last decade has been a nightmare for anybody in the RF game. Just talk to the boys at Handheld Audio and to write off five million quid's worth of kit uh, because of Brussels changing its mind. Um, it's, a, it's a tale of woe. Uh, and the bandwidth that's available to us is increasingly uh, smaller and smaller as government legislation gives more and more bandwidth to the computer companies who are preparing for future wireless technology to uh, help us rejoice in the great gift that the digital revolution has brought us in terms of social media. So um, there are some programs uh, that uh, you can, uh, some firmware that you can install on a laptop that you can plug all of your transmitters into that will give you readouts of RMS power and the frequencies and interference from other stuff and all the rest of it. Some great bits of kit. Um, they uh, need a bit of application to get them working properly and a bit of knowledge. But Workbench, for example, uh, is a really good piece of kit, uh, very handy. Um, mostly as far as licensing co is concerned, if you own the gear yourself, the onus is on you to provide the license. Uh, if you're renting the gear, then it's the company that you are renting it from who should be the license provider. And mostly, if you go and rent pro in-ear kit from any hire company, they will give you the licensing information on the site that you require. Very often, you'll need to tell them in advance. Um, but uh, uh, it needs to be done. Um, it, uh, there is now a third-party regulatory body uh, who are a non-government agency uh, who uh, are employed by the government on an incentive basis to police uh, particularly our larger festivals. And it brings me great joy when the big American rock act turn up and say, hey, no, buddy, we're going to use all our 500 megahertz. Now, that's illegal in this country. Uh, and so their solution is, well, we ain't going to turn them on till 20 minutes before the show, man. So they turn them on 20 minutes before the show, and in 10 minutes, there's the bloke with the clipboard there going, lads, unless you turn that off right now, it's a £20,000 fine, and I'm going to confiscate all of it. And uh, that's a moment of joy, really, watching the expression on the faces of the guys when they come over to you on the other side of the stage and say, hey, buddy, can I rent by a 12 in ear packs from you? Um, mixing. Mixing in ears. Very different skill to mixing wedges. Um, the first thing that I think about is output processing uh, because I want to be in control of the compression that's going on. Uh, as I explained earlier, there are three stages, the, the transmitter, the encoding, the transmission itself, and the decoding. Now, these little amplifiers, uh, they are only little amplifiers, and so uh, at a certain stage, they will not produce any more voltage, uh, even if you ask them to. So that is what I call natural power compression. Amplifier runs out of steam. Um, they also have peak limiters in them that are more or less user-adjustable. Uh, as do the transmitters, um, and depending on the bandwidth of the signal that you're allowed to transmit, that again, in the actual RF transmission process, there is compression uh, in order to deal with the relatively wide bandwidth that's required. Um, I don't like compression that's not in my control, because the artist is hearing something I'm not. Uh, so I like to take charge of the compression, 
and I use a lot of outboard compression when I'm mixing ears, and I uh, very often use outboard EQs as well. All of this stuff is available within most digital mixing desks these days. Uh, if you configure them correctly, you can get quite powerful stuff. I tend to use parametric EQs rather than graphic EQs on the output because their responses are smoother and there's less tendency to do the old monitor engineer trick of just cheeky out that, that naughty frequency. Um, because actually what you want is a smooth response. You don't want your musician to be missing two or three notes on the piano keyboard because you've decked that frequency on the graphic. So, um, uh, yeah, multiband compression I find very handy, uh, particularly uh, frequency keyable compression, because actually uh, the bandwidth that I was talking about of my 3K around 1K earlier on um, uh, is about vocal intelligibility. Uh, so I like to be able to compress around that bandwidth, uh, but actually not compress that bandwidth. So frequency keyable compressors are really handy uh, if there's a lot of musical information around the vocal range. You can often clear that up quite well using that kind of compression uh, to squash the stuff that is interfering or masking the vocal frequencies that you need to reproduce for the point of view of pitching. Um, it's a really useful tool. So that puts you actually in control uh, on your surface, uh, your console surface of what all of the stuff that's plugged into the back of the desk is doing, rather than having a tail wag the dog uh, and be, you be uh, <coughs> beholden to the compression and frequency response of the kit you're using, take control of it yourself. Um, and work with your artist. Always another little hint that I should have mentioned earlier on when I was talking about belt packs, actually. Uh, I always pay attention when I take the belt packs back at the end of the night of where uh, the, the volume level is, because artists never turn them off, they just take them off and chuck them in the box. Um, uh, but if they do, always make sure, because, you know, if you're running your listen pack at eight and the guitar player's is at four, very substantial difference between you and him, and that's one thing that you're not in control of. And very often, you know, I watch artists very carefully, that little, that little half a dB tweak that they do three or four times during the show, that's three dBs over where you started, which is quite a lot. So um, I'm always trying to be aware of where the artists are running their belt packs and try and mix accordingly. Uh, and I try to get everybody to do the same thing. Uh, start at 2 o'clock, you know, 60%. So you've got plenty of headroom. If we all start there, then we're all reading from the same hymn sheet. I've got the same reference point that my 3 dB gain on any send is actually going to be 3 dB, not 1.5 dB if his belt pack's only at half the level of mine, or vice versa, 6 dB if it's at twice the level, which is even more significant. So, yeah, get the output processing right. Um, now, the real big thing, as far as I'm concerned uh, with ears, is the uh, input stuff. Because mixing for ears is a totally different ball game from mixing for wedges or indeed mixing for uh, PA. <coughs> it's uh, a much more precise, you have to be very much more considerate with your EQing, your input treatment. You really have to be very judicial in your use of gates and compressors. Uh, as a monitor engineer, I try not to use gates and compressors at all. Um, uh, gates, on drums you shouldn't really need to do it, particularly if your band is all ears, if you're uh, getting rid of most of the acoustic sources and your drummer can tune the drum kit, you shouldn't need to use noise gates. And the problem with using compressors as channel inserts live is that unless there is the magical and mythical button that should be on every monitor desk and is on only one that I've ever encountered. Actually, two now, because you can do it. Uh, used to be able to do it on an old American mixer called a Harrison. Um, uh, but uh, you can, uh, there's now one digital board in the marketplace that will allow you to do this. And that is the pre post insert button on every send. So, for example, if you have a keyboard player, you can compress the keyboard player to all the musicians on the stage except himself. So his playing isn't affected by 
hearing the compression. Because if you're playing over compression, you tend to overplay, you play harder. So the stuff that it was already a nuisance to everybody else in the first place, particularly I talk about keyboard players because of the difference between middle C and a big handful of left. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's six or seven times louder. Um, so um, uh, in order to uh, prevent the keyboard player from blowing everybody else off their perch, you need to squash them without affecting their own playing. Um, so I, unless uh, I <coughs> have that facility available, your choice is you Y split your channels, so you have one compressed set and an uncompressed set, um, <coughs> or don't do it. I tend to try and avoid it wherever I possibly can, really. Um, again, EQing, EQ judiciously. You know, make sure that the frequency response of your, uh, uh, your drum kit mics, for example, is exactly what it, you want it to be. Uh, you know, you, judicious use of high and low pass filters for hi-hats and overheads, um, because all of the bumps that you get from the riser and down the cymbal stands and all of the rest of it, whilst they're not particularly audible through wedges, they're very audible in ears. So it's, uh, it's really important that you, uh, that you uh, are really on top of that. The other last thing, and by really the most important thing I'd like to talk about, is ambient miking. Um, because you are dealing with a bunch of people who are shut out from the world, uh, it's very easy uh, for them to regard putting the ears in as a sort of punishment, uh, you know, as a restrictive thing. Uh, but if you get your ambient miking right, uh, then it can work really well. Uh, I'll just give you one little example before I finish. Uh, again, the pop act I was talking about earlier on. Three sets of ambient mics, a stereo mic on the stage in front of the drum kit, uh, a pair of shotguns pointing at the fans downstairs, uh, down in the front row, uh, and uh, a pair of 414s at front of house. And I'd got compressors with varying different rise times. So she, the girl stops singing, immediately the stage mic comes up so she can hear the chat of the band on stage. After three seconds, the shotgun mics come so she can hear the kids down the front shouting and screaming. And after 10 seconds, the room comes up. So in between tunes, she can hear the room. As soon as she starts singing, they all squash. Uh, they're there to an extent, but only to a very small extent. And again, you, by using the output threshold you can, and output levels, you can mix the amount of ambience in according to taste. But that kind of ambient miking actually makes them feel that they're in a much more natural environment uh, and uh, makes it much easier for them. One other thing about miking is that there are a lot of people these days use cue microphones. Um, you know, very often monitor, uh, <coughs> monitor engineers will give techs belt packs uh, and a microphone so they can talk directly to you, the monitor engineer, and give you cues. Um, there are some bands I've worked with uh, who have got uh, microphones on the stage with little paddles they can push to talk to the monitor guy. Uh, be careful if you do this because you finish up with the band telling each other jokes and uh, slagging each other off to you during the show, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it can become uh, really annoying as I found out to my cost, having done that. Yeah, there it is. Uh, I could go, you know, uh, it's a big subject. I could talk for days about it, really, uh, but I'm not going to, because um, I've already bored myself. Uh, but yeah, do, if you want to further this discussion at any stage, I'll be hanging around here or on the Soul Sound stall over the next uh, day and a bit. So thank you so much for coming. And uh, yeah, grab one of us for the Thank you. Grab Justin and we'll be around for the car as well.